When David, now this is, uh, David came back, because this, this happened after Saul threw the spear at him and stuck it in the wall when he was playing his harp. Uh, when David fled for the first time. So it says, then David fled from there to Rome and went to Jonathan. And he asked, what have I done? What is my crime? How, how have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Now listen to Jonathan's response here. He said, never. Like, never. Jonathan replied, you are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. You can see that David's all, all focused on the negative. He's focused on, why is your dad trying to kill me? I didn't do anything. Why is he throwing spears at me? Why do I have to go hide? I, I've done everything he asked me to do. I've, I've went out every army he asked me to conquer. I conquered every, I married your sister. I, I did everything he asked me to do. But Jonathan steers him away from the negativity. It goes on to say, but David looked, David took an oath and said, your father's eyes, and he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this, for he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, there is only a step between me and death. And this, this goes on because when, when uh, at that particular moment, that's when they were celebrating a feast. And David goes on in, in, uh, in those passages to say, you, you go back. And when I'm not at the celebration the first night, see how your dad, your father, King Saul reacts. Well, the first night King Saul says, it figured that David was just unceremonial clean, so he didn't show up. The second night, he said, he asked Jonathan, where is he? Where is that son of Jesse? And Jonathan said, well, he asked if he could go back to his home. They were celebrating. And the very thing that happened to David, King Saul did to his own son. He got outraged. And he called him all kinds of names. And then he threw the spear at him and tried to <clears throat> stick him to the wall and kill him. His own son. So when we look at friends will take you away from the negative. They will steer you and encourage you. Friends are also friends that are friends in the absent. That means that we don't have to be together all the time to be friends. And in verse 14, in uh, the same chapter, uh, 1 Samuel 20, verse 14 through 17, it says, But show me the unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness, as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from everyone of David's enemies from the face of the earth. 16. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath. 
out of love for him because he loves, he loved him as himself. So what, what we see going on here is this, this is the covenant that they made to Jonathan said, listen, make this oath that you will take care of me or my family if anything happens to me. You will, Jonathan said, even if I die, this friendship goes on forever. You will step up, you will take care of, of my, my family. When I have a son, you'll take care of my son. And, and David actually did that because as you, if you've read this whole passage of through 18 through, I think it's 23, 25, you see that Jonathan, one, did have a son. Two, you see that Jonathan died before David. And David honored that commitment that him and Jonathan had. He honored it and he took care and helped and uh, took care of his son. So what does, through all this, we got to look at one important thing is Jonathan has nothing to gain in this friendship. But he has everything to lose. Because Jonathan is supposed to be the next king. When his dad steps down or dies, Jonathan is supposed to take be the king. But you, as we know from earlier in, in uh, the book of Samuel is that David was anointed to be king. And God gave Jonathan the ability to see the anointing on David through all the victories he had, not only with, with Goliath, but through the victories of 200, 200 Philistines here, 400 Philistines here, throughout his history of being a, uh, in charge of the army, we see that David had victory over and over and over. And Jonathan seen this, where his father was jealous. So David, Jonathan had nothing to gain out of this relationship. And I asked, I asked myself this question, and I, I, I throw it out for you guys to think about at this point. What in our friendships, in our relationships, really, <coughs> do we try to gain something out of those relationships from someone? Or do we accept that friendship, that relationship, as equal? Because see, in so many times in, in today's world, when we look at relationships, we look at friendships, it's always a give or take. I'm your friend now because you can do this, this, and this for me and help me move forward. But then that sort of, once you get those, those things accomplished, the friendship sort of is less important. <coughs> I see, Suzette and I see this so much in, in the teens, you know. One week they're friends with this person, the next week they're mad at them and they're friends with the next person, the, the another person. And we're like, so we'll, we'll talk to them about it. And they'll be like, well, I just don't, I just don't like them anymore. Why don't you like them? Well, because they quit doing this with me. They, they quit doing that. So it was the relationship was based on, not on commitment, not on friends, 
but on what they could provide, what they could do. Many times we look at our relationships in that way, in a worldly way, instead of a biblical. So one of the things I hope that we get out of this today as we continue here is when we look at our friends we have in our life, is that relationship based on biblical principles like David and Jonathan? Or is it based more on worldly principles of what can they do to me, for me to fulfill this? Because we see in Jonathan, we see a true friend. We see that not only is he not worried about he's not going to be king, he's going against his father who is king. He will see here in, in, a, in the next verse or two that he also lectured his father on what was right and what was wrong. Because he had a lecture, he had a talk with his father and, and said, why, why, do you kill, why do you want to kill David? He's done nothing but good for you. He's done nothing wrong. He's done everything that you've asked him. He's brought honor to Israel. He's brought honor to the kingdom. So he even went against his father in trying to persuade his father. Why? Why are you being this way? And I'm sure some of us have had those conversations with people. Why are you acting this way towards me? What did I do? So in 1 Samuel 18, 1, it says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. It is the plan of God for souls to be knitted together in friendship. All of us ought to go out and about our days looking for someone to be a Jonathan for and by our side. Taking, taking all of us a Jonathan for and by the same token, all of us fall into the category of being a David. Some days we are David. Some days we are the ones on the run. Some days we are the ones that are struggling, asking the question, what did I do to deserve this? What did I do to this person to deserve that? Maybe it's even in our own, you know, in our own marriages, in our friendships, in, in our relationships at work. Sometimes we need to pause and, and know that we need a Jonathan to come beside us and say, hey, and steer us back to God. Because at every moment that Jonathan and David were together, Jonathan redirected him back to God. There has been, there has to be a lesson that we gain from this physical plane, but there is a spiritual realm at play that we cannot deny. We must have some friends, friends around us that help us to see the priorities of walking with God. That's my second challenge today. The people we keep around us now, we're supposed to go out and make disciples. Don't get me wrong. We're supposed to go out and, and outreach and evangelize. But the people you keep around you and you call friends, when you need them the most, when you're in your darkest, deepest,
struggle. When you, when you come to them, do they join in on the negativity with you? Oh yeah, that's that person, I know that person, that's why they did that, that's just how they are, that's how their family is, that about, you know. Or, do they say, hey, let's pause here and redirect you to the walk, the priorities of walking with God, and how we are supposed to handle relationships, friendships. Do your friends do that for you? Do you have someone, a friend in your life, a person in your life that helps redirect you? Because we're all human and we all get in that mode where we're negative, we're bitter, we're frustrated, we're asking questions. The other question I would ask is, are your friends willing to sacrifice? Because we see in 1 Samuel 18, 4, that Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing, gave it to David, along with his tunic, and even his sword and his bow and arrow. Now you might think, eh, that's just custom. But here's what, the, here's what that means. Jonathan wanted to give David something that belonged to him, but even more than that, it was something that had meaning to him. And Jonathan passed along to David a robe that has come from the royal court. And then he gave him his weapons. So in a sense, Jonathan was giving David a robe that would help him gain access into the royal courts. It added to his stature because it was an endorsement coming from the prince of the kingdom. So it wasn't just a robe or a tomb. It had significant meaning. Because when he had, when Jonathan handed that to David, he was giving him access. He was, he was basically saying, scripture doesn't say this, but in, in my words, I'd see that as this. Jonathan was saying, here's your next king. I'm giving him the, the royal robe. I'm giving him the, my tunic. I'm giving him access to the royal courts through all this. So he's actually saying to, his, to the people, this man is important. Even though I'm, he didn't say, even though I'm supposed to be king, he left that go. Not once did I read in scripture where Jonathan said, man, I'm not going to be king. I don't want to, you know. David took it from me. Not once. When they met after David was talking to Saul, it says that they became one. One of her. Jonathan loved him as himself as a brotherly, godly love that was willing to go against his own father to keep David alive, was willing to give him his royal robe and tunic to show his support of David. But it doesn't stop there because it, he gave him a gift of weapons of Jonathan. This proved that he was also interested in David being able to survive the attacks that would come in the wilderness. Because David, for years, lived in the wilderness, going from town to town to town, running from Saul. 
And Jonathan wanted to make them survive these attacks. No matter what enemy may have, have determined to kill David, his friend had equipped him to fight. Does your friend, your relationship, equip you to handle the fight that's before you? It might not be a bow, it might not be a bow and arrow, but do they equip you with words? <coughs> do they direct you? with words from the Bible, Scripture? Do they remind you, hey, maybe you need to stop and pray? You see, Jonathan spoke well of David, and here's the passage I was saying, it was 1 Samuel 19, 4 and 5, where Jonathan talks to his dad, King Saul. He says, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, this, his father, and said to him, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. What has he done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all of Israel. And you saw it. And we're glad. Why then would you do him wrong? In an innocent man like David, by killing him. That shows the loyalty that Jonathan had for David. See, a true friend will be loyal. Even if it's their own family members that they need to talk to. Even if it's their boss that they need to talk to. They'll be loyal to you. First to God and then to you. But they will be loyal. Because that's huge for Jonathan to step up and tell his dad that. To tell the king, his father. If Jonathan would not have been a true blue friend to David, he would have begun to undermine him so that Saul would put even more pressure on David. But Jonathan refused to allow himself to be drawn in the pettiness, envy, and jealousy of King Saul. That's huge. How many times have we got caught up in the pettiness? the envy, and the jealousy of a relationship. How many times have, have we not been loyal and stuck up for the person? You know, Jesus tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. I believe that fits in his past because David, Jonathan loved David as himself. Who's your neighbor? It might be your friend. It might be your co-workers. There's no defined definition of who the neighbor is. It's everybody. So when we look at relationships, this can go even beyond a close friend between two people. Because when was the last time we stuck up and were loyal and stuck up for those that are hurting in the community? 
when was the last time we didn't walk away from someone that come up on the street and started having a conversation? And we're like, I don't have time for this right now. Or maybe it was a homeless person. See, I believe this kind of friendship, this kind of relationship, is obviously, without a shadow of a doubt, a biblical relationship, because it's right in the Bible. But I believe it goes beyond just a friendship between two people. I believe it goes to how we are to relate to people, whether it's a friend, our spouse, family, or those that we run into on the streets, those that are different than us, those that are considered outcasts of the community. <clears throat> so we know that a friend will steer you away from negativity. We know that a friend will is loyal. We know that a friendship goes beyond daily interaction, weekly interaction, or monthly interaction. It doesn't matter if you're present with each other or it's a phone call every six months. You pick up where you left off like you were together the day before. Too many relate too many friendships, too many relationships today and when that person doesn't have a need in your life anymore. We've experienced who's that and I've experienced it from family, from friends, when we moved here. You know, you have all these friends that are always calling you and everything when you live in the area. But when you move 18, 1900 miles away and you're not present in your life and you're the one trying to make, you're the one making the phone calls all the time to keep the connection, you soon realize that, are we really that important if we have to make the phone calls every single time? And I'm talking friends and I'm talking family. Friendship goes both ways. A friendship has great communication from both sides. And I'll finish with this because I think it's another great example from Scripture. As I was putting this together, praying over it, it reminded me of a paralyzed man. His friends carried him on a mat to Jesus. They got there and they seen that the house was full. The crowd was outside. They didn't say to the paralyzed friend on the mat, they didn't say, I'm sorry, I don't have time to wait for you. I'm just going to let you lay here. And maybe Jesus will come out later when he's done. They didn't say that. No, these four dedicated friends crawled up to the roof, cut a hole in it, carried their friend up on to the roof, and lowered them at Jesus. I believe that passage is a powerful illustration of the kind of people we need in our life today. Not only did they carry him, they seen the need, they carried him, but yet they laid him at the feet of Jesus so he could be healed. So my question comes back to what I asked earlier. Do your friends point you to Jesus? 
to your friends. Are they there? Whether you've seen them yesterday or you've seen them, you haven't seen them in three months, six months. Are your friends loyal? Because see, loyalty is a key to keeping a friendship. Are we willing to speak the truth, not only to the friend in need, but to the people around that are still cutting him up or her up, still downgrading him? Are we willing to do that? Because we're called to. We're called to love everyone unconditionally as Christ loved us. So that's this not about that that is not just about our walk for us personally. It's our call to go out and make disciples and love everybody as our name. Love yourself and love your name. So as we leave here today, think about that. Maybe it's time to evaluate who's in your life and who's not in your life. Maybe it's time to you know, look at, well, they say they're my friend, but I haven't heard from them, or when I needed them, they were, you know, maybe it's time to ask for the reconciliation. Because today's world, our view, our biblical view of a friend, our biblical view of a relationship, is not the same as the words. We need to set the preface, the example for the rest of the world in our relationships. Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, your word is powerful. And Lord, your seed has been planted. Now, Lord, I pray that you bring the harvest. You bring the harvest that needs to happen. Lord, that you, you bring forth your glory through these words. And Lord, I pray that you help us to be better friends, biblical friends. Lord, Lord I pray that you help each one of us to be that biblical example in our homes, in our workplaces, to our friends. That if one of our friends is not a believer, Lord, that they would want to know you through our example of biblical friendships, our biblical standards. So, Lord, bring it forth for your glory. And, Lord, I just also want to just continue to pray a blessing over this church. Lord, I pray that you just continue to shower your presence here, continue to give leadership wisdom and guidance in all that they do. And Lord, just shower them with your blessings. Not for anyone's glory, but your glory. I just thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As Murph closes out with the song, if you're struggling today with a relationship, if you're struggling with a relationship or a friendship, I would love to pray with you today that God will just move in that relationship. So as Murph finishes out with a song, I'll be down front here and um, just come up as he's playing and I would love to pray with you. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> You want to go ahead and stand and sit our closing song?